Hey there, I'm Scott, and this is Tangents. Well, I noticed that I haven't recorded one of these that would be the part two to the journalism science thing that I was thinking about. Uh, I thought about doing that today, and I think I'm not going to. I might just dabble a little bit on it, but uh, probably not going to, to get too much of it done this time. I, I have some thoughts on what the next one would be, but uh, it's it's one of those things where it's much it's much easier and faster to come up with something that's kind of extemporaneous than not that these are all fully extemporaneous. I mean, I do think about what I want to say before. I have kind of a set of bullets, um, but the problem really comes when you're doing something that's more of like a class format. You actually have to. Have almost a lesson plan and it takes it takes a lot more time and effort. I, I notice even like the first one that I did on that, um, if I was going to do that in a way that I'd be happy with, I would spend probably you know, weeks to a month just prepping that and I just don't have time to do that right now. So I, I'm, I'm sure I will continue that as a series but it's probably, probably going to be kind of in the background. Um, so what I do want to talk about today and uh, yeah, there's several things I could uh, I could go over, but the the biggest one is something that I annoys the shit out of me. I, I it's one of these things also like I I do recognize that you have to live in the world as it is and not as you would like it to be or as it should be, to some extent at least. But I I watch a fair bit of YouTube. I listen to a fair number of podcasts, including podcasts like the Slate Political Gab Fest, where I actually, since they came up with the Slate Plus thing, I've paid for that um, consistently more than they ask. And, you know, I, I understand you have to make money, right? It is the world as it is. Uh, but I, I fucking despise how much all of this shit uh, just revolves around sponsors and sponsorship. And so that... That is what I want to talk about today. And specifically, I do think it actually has some relevance to journalism because there's a lot of science and technical journalism, air quotes journalism, which really seems to imply that it's journalism, but it's actually basically just echoing press releases and going out and, you know, amplifying companies. And, and to some extent, yeah, you do, it is part of the job, like you're, you're showing people what's new, right? But you're also not supposed to be a, steno a stenographer. So being a journalist, I, I think one of the key points that really gets missed is it's not just about presenting things unfiltered as they are. If you're a journalist, you have to, and, and I think this is an essential aspect of journalism, you have to look at the evidence to some extent and weigh it and then present the best, your best at least, understanding of the interpretations. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you're presenting the ground truth um, and, and it certainly doesn't mean, you know, there's a very big difference between what I just said and then presenting opinions as though they're fact, which is another thing that I see continually. I, if, I, if I'm, I mean, just to like bend back to the journalism thing, uh, I, I see so much of what passes as journalism today, which is essentially just opinion pieces. And I, I'm not saying that there's no place for that. Apologies for the helicopter. I will probably, probably not edit that out, but uh, I am sure that you heard that. Um, well, it'd be funny if you didn't. But anyway, I am not saying that opinion doesn't have any place. I'm not saying that like op-ed doesn't have, you know, some role. It's, it's important to understand where other people are coming from, what they're thinking, this kind of stuff. I do agree with that. Um, the problem is that so much of that is framed as journalism when in fact it's more just so, you know, I mean, I guess it is kind of a, a shade of it, but it's not really the essential part. It's certainly not looking at the current situation, the facts and the evidence, 
and presenting your best understanding of how things are. So for me, and call me crazy, you know, like if, if you're presenting about climate change or evolution or vaccine safety and efficacy or whatever you're going to do, it's not a thing where you just sort of go, okay, well, there are three sides and, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what person X says X, person Y says Y, person Z says Z, and you decide. No, I mean, you know, there are not equal, I, I mean, I guess if there were a situation where you actually had three groups and they all had very equal amounts of support and maybe then. Uh, support, incidentally, is also not democratic. So there is a thing, like, it's a, it's a complicated thing. It gets back to this, uh, you don't want experts to be a priesthood, but experts do, expertise does have value. Um, so, you know, you don't have consensus as just, like, this is how things are decided though consensus actually does have value. So weighing those two things is important. Uh, worse than consensus among experts, because at least that you know says something. Consensus among people, I, I see all of these polls, like, oh, the majority of people think there should be a vaccine mandate. Well, yeah, first off, yes, there absolutely should be a fucking vaccine mandate. Uh, these things are safe, they are effective. Uh, the risk associated with them is essentially negligible compared to basically anything that you do in life. And the risk associated with not doing them is very great. And the risk not only to you, but to others is huge. So it's just not defensible not to require them of anyone who, now granted there are people, very small, small contingent, but there are people who just cannot get them for legitimate medical reasons. Maybe you get some exceptions for those, but uh, when you're talking about people for like religious exceptions or things like this, yeah. And I'm not saying like you, you know, get jackbooted thugs and you grab people and just inject them in the arm. But I am saying if you want to participate in certain things in society, you should be vaccinated. You know, it's just like a fucking no brainer. Um, if you want to go on a fucking plane, you should be vaccinated. You should wear a fucking mask and you should probably be tested before not that the testing is a magical... This is one thing that drives me nuts. I, uh, I I don't generally look at Dennis Prager. I'm not a fan. I think he's a complete asshole. And I'm also not an anti-fan in the sense that, uh, you know, that whole Howard Stern private parts thing. It's like, oh, well, the people that like him listen for this much time. And the people that hate him listen for this much time, which is even bigger. No, I, I want him to just go away. I do not give a fuck. I don't, I feel bad even mentioning his name here because I'm, you know, giving him some negative attention. But he posted something, tweeted something that basically said, you know, like, if, if you've been tested, then why do we have to wear masks on an airplane? It's always very important when you see, when you read these people's shit to just picture the baby with the poopy diapers stomping their feet. Um, but, yeah, but... That's, that's what you should be picturing when, when you see people like this. But you know, the, the thing is, testing is not perfect. Testing, first off, testing does have false negatives and false positives, um, no matter what the test is. And uh, testing furthermore, even if it was perfect and did exactly what it's advertised to do, you can be infected and not have a significant viral load or not be shedding virus at the moment and that would be not detected. You'd come back negative, and who knows, in an hour or a day, you're shedding. You know, it's not, this is not like a weird theoretical thing that could happen. This is something that happens all the fucking time. You know, people treat testing as though, you know, you got the checkbox and you're good. And it's just not that, it's not the case. If you really wanna do it, like the correct way to do it would be basically like, testing and isolating and testing again after some isolation. People aren't doing that. And uh, that's not what they're talking about. So, you know, this whole idea, and I'm not saying that testing is bad. Testing is definitely worth doing, but it's not a magical cure-all. And it certainly doesn't eliminate the need for masks or for vaccines. Anyway, 
rolling back um, the sponsorship thing. I think, you know, when, when you're watching something on YouTube and then they spend, uh, even when they're good ads, and there are good ads, although they are by far the exception and not the rule, uh, you know, somebody's talking about something that they actually, you believe, use. And sometimes, very, very rarely, you'll see somebody talk about something and you're like, oh, that's actually a thing that I might actually use myself. But that's not the, that's not the majority. But even when that's the case, it's annoying as fuck. Uh, and it's something that, you know, again, there's the world I want to live in and the world that we do live in. You have to pay the bills. Um, part of the reason that you're spending time, I mean, you can see how unproduced this is and how, you know, just minimal and how little prep I put into it. And yet this already takes, you know, several hours a week. It's not, you know, it's not 20 hours, but it's probably like four or five hours at least. I've never actually done a time budget, but if I do like an hour of video, there's time involved in, uh, you know, recording everything. There's time involved in the little bit of production that I do. This is the reason that I'm not going to go back and edit out that sound because I would have to listen to the whole thing or at least, you know, like make notes of where those things are, find them and go back and edit it and recut it. And it just takes so much time. Like just what I do already takes a lot of time. And I'm not... I'm not complaining about that. I do it because I like it. And I do like it when people talk about the stuff that I've talked about here. But I also, you know, have a finite amount of time that I can, can put into it. So sponsoring, like having a sponsor for your videos lets you do that. And it's great when people have really tight, highly produced stuff. I like that a lot. I understand you can't just do that for fun because of the way the world is sort of structured, but it doesn't need to be that way. And it should, frankly, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, it's like so much of what people do is centered around money and, uh, you know, like making a living, all of this kind of stuff. It gets to, I mentioned the Gab Fest. Um, yesterday was Thursday and uh, it, tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So they were talking about 9-11 and they were talking about uh, a number of things. But one of the things that came up in the Gab Fest, and again, I, I'm a big fan, but one of the things that came up, and it's weird, never mind how this is connected to all of that, but um, Emily Bazelon, who I generally like, uh, was talking about education, university. And uh, the group of them were talking about this, but she in particular said, you know, like, Something to the effect of, you know, well, you know, you could look at, uh, it, to, to be fair, was kind of making the devil's argument sort of thing, but not entirely. But she was saying, you know, like, well, you would be better, or some people would be better off not going to college and going to trade school or whatever. And yeah, it's true, but that is not the purpose of education. It is, our, our world is distorted as fuck that... People have, and I mean, to be fair, it's a pragmatic decision to say, okay, college is going to cost a shit ton of money. It's going to take time and uh, you have a finite amount of time and you need just to live in this world, you need money. So there, is, there are arguments, you know, it's not like a completely absurd argument that you should be pragmatic and should consider ROI, but that's not the way it fucking should be. The Arizona state constitution and Arizona is not the most like lefty state in the, in the union. I don't know if you know this, but our constitution says university or higher education should be as like available to everybody, actually like men, women, whoever, and as close to free as possible. Now, the people who wrote that writing as close to free as possible rather than free, um, did not seem to understand a basic aspect of human nature that, you know, people kind of, they get this lawyer thing where they're like, read the contract and they're kind of like, well, okay. The thing I always think about here is um, like in Israel, there are people who sort of 
won't do things on the Sabbath. They won't, uh, it's, it's Shabbat, so they won't do, um, they won't like flush a toilet. But there's a whole industry built around kind of lawyering around God. It's like, okay, you can't do this yourself, but we can make a machine that automatically does this periodically. And so it fi- effectively kind of like circumvents the whole thing. So it's like, do you really think you're fooling God? I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think God exists or is a meaningful concept, but if it was, um, you know, come on, come on. But you have people doing this kind of stuff and it's just like, uh... so anyway, rolling back. I, I, I go off on that for a while, but uh, this whole idea that education is just vocational training. And it is not just in the university, and it's also not just, uh, like, I mean, Germany is pretty good in a lot of ways, but they have something where at a very young age, they put people in tracks, which are essentially career tracks. And, you know, I'm not saying, like, great things about Germany, but uh, this is something that I don't think is a good thing. I think it is good to find people's strengths and weaknesses and prepare them for life based on those. And I do, you know, I have no objection at all to vocational training. It's a, it's very good. It's interesting and it's important. It can let you have a more fulfilled life. But I do think no matter what your path, uh, there's a lot of value to like, if you're going to be a machinist, learning about art history might seem meaningless to you. Um, but it's actually going to enrich your life, like legitimately. Learning about history, history, uh, learning about philosophy, learning about science, at least a survey level kind of thing on all of these topics. If you're going to be voting in elections, if you're going to be making decisions that affect other people, I think you actually need to learn these things. I don't think it's just a matter of, you know, like, well, if you're going to work in some subject where you directly use this no, no. And there's a, there's a big problem where people are like, oh, well, you know, like, and this is actually another thing that Emily said to roll back to the gab fest, was basically like in, in our lives, we generally tend to specialize on like one thing or a couple of things, and that's what we do. And yeah, that's true. And she was saying like, yeah, the liberal arts education isn't really preparing you for that. It's true, technically, but that's not the fucking point of the education. And the fact that people, it's depressing to me that people who, generally speaking, like, were aligned pretty well, and uh, and yet she's thinking this way. And you see, like, other people who definitely are not aligned with me that well, who totally think, like, oh, it's just job training. Like, literally, the only point is to learn enough to do your job and then get the fuck out. Um, It's not something that leads us to good places. It's not the way things should be. Um, I do not believe, assuming that civilization doesn't implode, assuming things continue and things progress, well, those are, the, those are big assumptions, but assume that that, ap- that actually happens. At some point in the future, even if we had something where it's kind of like a ANCAP dystopia for a while, at a certain point, I do think you end up with something closer to, you know, I'm not saying like exactly a Star Trek future, but something where like all labor essentially is free. You know, the effort, the toil, all of that kind of stuff, basically it gets reduced to the price of energy. And, you know, once you have machine intelligence, that's good enough. And once you have energy sources that are good enough, and this also like, even if you imagine uh, you never come up with fusion, Building space-based uh, solar and beaming it down, pretty fucking easy when you have essentially an unlimited uh, amount of labor that you can can put up there and do whatever you need to do. Uh, dangerous also for other reasons, but you know, it's a good thing for that. So now you have unlimited power effectively, and you have reduced all you know all physical labor to something that's just a matter of power and resources, materials, um, you know, everything basically, and I'm not saying everything is free, obviously there are fundamental limits, but 
everything that you would practically want. And when I say that, I don't just mean like having a nice house and having air conditioning and TV and all this kind of stuff. I mean, if you wanted to have a plane, you know, or, you know, like other similar extravagances, a sports car, whatever, that would be effectively free. And, you know, it, when I say that, I mean also like the nicest possible, like if you wanted the Bugatti Veyron or um, McLaren kind of thing, you know, something that's like millions of dollars, um, that would be effectively free. Now, of course, somebody has to design it and then you have to get into, well, do you have machine intelligence that is capable of that or do people do it? Yeah, it's more complicated. Uh, but even if you never develop the machine intelligences that could do that, uh, which I think is probably, yeah, I, it is hard. It's much harder than people seem to think, but it's not by any means impossible. Um, or, or when I say not impossible, I mean like we could, pr we're probably, if we really focused our efforts, could do it in relatively short order. Yeah, like easily within my lifetime and probably significantly faster if that was like a real focus and uh, you know, but anyway, rolling off. Once you have that kind of level of things, yeah, you can keep people working, but at a certain point, it's a metastable state. And even if that went on for a very long period of time, I do think eventually you get to the point where things are just so free and so, or so close to free that essentially it's not even worth metering. Yeah. Air is a finite resource, but I don't have to pay for air. You know, I can pretty much breathe uh, with, within limitations, obviously, because like if I go outside right now and I breathe, um, I smell burning, I don't know, brush fire or whatever. If I have a neighbor who's smoking, you know, it's not exactly free, but it could be and effectively is. So imagine also like cars or houses it's so cheap to make basically free. You could have landlords in that kind of situation, but at a certain point, and especially once uh, it doesn't really matter where you live and you know, in principle, you could just go anywhere. It's hard to hold a monopoly on certain things. Um, you know, like even, even if you're Jeff Bezos kind of thing or kind of scale, very hard to hold a monopoly. And if you can't hold a monopoly, then just basic market forces will force the, the cost of these things down eventually. Eventually, obviously. Um, more complicated than that in practice, and it's not a direct path, but although it could be. But yeah. So once you imagine you're there, you, you're in a situation where people can kind of do effectively what they want. Now, I do understand, you know, there are several aspects of human nature that you have to worry about. Like people do have an absolute need. I, I think it's a just biological need to feel like what we're doing matters or is important in some way. It doesn't have to be life or death. It doesn't have to be like something that is you know, just like massive and what you're doing is going to affect millions of people. But you do kind of have to feel like you're doing something that is not just pushing a button and completely trivial. Uh, even, even people who are playing video games, they want to have that kind of feeling. And, and not to disparage people playing video games. Um, when everything is free, or effectively so, you, obviously like there, there are massive projects that would not be. But if everything in your life that you would really realistically want is effectively free, play video games if you fucking want. doesn't even matter. Um, yeah, if you imagine you could do that, I don't think most people would. Even the people that want to play video games, at a certain point, they want to do other things. They, they have social needs. So you'd have people on Twitch, or the equivalent, and they would be socializing with people, even if they weren't making money from it. Uh, it's, it's a thing like uh, OnlyFans. I, I have zero objection to people like, you know, if, if you want to sell pornography of yourself, I, I have no objection to it. I have no moral or ethical qualms about that. You know, go ahead, go sick. But I do dislike the fact that we're in a situation now where people feel like they're, they need money. They're in a, 
Like they, they cannot find another thing that's going to give them anything like what they could get uh, just for like showing their tits. Uh, you know, like, or, or whatever they're doing on there. And you see that and you're like, ah, it's just, it's a depressing situation. You, you have people who are doing this kind of thing. Like it, it is a luxury by all means that I can sit here and fuck around and waste hours doing this. If I was doing something in life, which was like, uh, if I was a roofer or if I was a carpenter or somebody who was actually building stuff and like exhausted at the end of the day, uh, I, I wouldn't have time for this. If I was making much less money an hour, if I was making minimum wage, I couldn't fucking think about doing this. Um, you know, and, and I understand it's a luxury, but it's a luxury that everybody could have. And it's also a luxury that, you know, I'm, I'm an existence proof that shows you don't need to be compensated for doing something like this. You don't need to be compensated for doing a lot of the things that, you know, almost everything if I was constructing, I guess, my sort of like ideal existence, it wouldn't be one where I'm not working at all. Uh, it would certainly be one where I never have to worry about money, uh, you know, by all means. But I'd probably just be tinkering with things. I'd be teaching people stuff. I would be like working on engineering projects with other people. I'd be like pushing the ball forward. I'd be doing you know, a, a lot of stuff. I would probably, I'd be like a, if I could, I'd be probably like a professor doing, you know, just dabbling in, like I'd, I'd have plasma physics and I'd have supercomputing stuff and I'd have machine learning and I would have robotics and I'd probably have some um, like protein design or, you know, just biological kind of stuff. I'd have a bunch of different projects going. I'd have clothing, I'd have a clothing line. Uh, because I hate, I pretty much hate all clothing. And the reason for that also, I, I've talked about fashion, not in a while, but uh, talked about it. I do not really give that much of a fuck what's in style or not. Uh, but still, I cannot, I've like involuntarily ended up with socks that are only ankle high. Um, those luckily seem to have gone out of fashion, but I... It wasn't like I wanted them. It was just like at a certain point that was kind of like what was out there and I needed socks. And incidentally, those are not a good plan because they roll down and you end up, um, if you walk or do anything that uses your feet, you end up rubbing skin off of your ankle with the stupid things. Uh, you know, I'm not saying the knee high socks are, are great either, but you know, it's, it is weird how much that is a thing now. And it was like my, my uncle you know, when I was a little kid, he would wear the knee high socks and kids would make fun of him for it because when he was a kid, that was popular. And now it's popular again. The grandma slacks that I see women wearing now, they're like, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, but it's a thing like you, because you're not making your clothes, uh, you're sort of stuck with what's out there and you pretty much have no choice. Sunglasses. I, now I will say, the wraparound Oakleys have been kind of taken up by um, by the MAGA kind of people, so I'm not super keen on that, but I gotta tell you, when Oakley was Oakley and not owned by Luxottica, they made really good glasses. Especially, you know, the plastic ones were always kind of like, eh, hit or miss, but the metal ones that they made, fucking nicely engineered and worked well, and the, lens, the optics were great, and then the fact that they do wrap around you know, it's not just a stylistic choice, it's a practical choice because now all the fucking glasses are these flat things that don't wrap around. And if the sun is coming out from the side, it's in your fucking eyes. Like, it, it, that's not the fuck. The only reason I want glasses is to keep the sun out of my eyes and to make it less bright when I'm outside. And I'm, I'm pretty much fucked there. Like, you, you have very little, very few options and you can't, if you get Oakley's, you're going to get stuff that's like pot metal, um, aluminum, you know, just garbage that will literally break. Um, what, what are you going to do with that? It's not, and, and they don't even, not only that, but they don't look very good anymore. And, uh, you know, there's just, you're stuck with fashion. Anyway, um, I, I would, I would dabble in a lot of things. I, 
it, it, given the resources, I would, uh, you know, not be just sitting on my ass. And I don't think that I'm weird or exceptional there. I think that's like a common thing. Now, other people might have less varied interests. They might work on, maybe they're more interested in painting or poetry. Maybe they're more interested in just uh, being a machinist and making steam engines. Or uh, I say just, I don't mean that to be disparaging, but you know, like they just want to focus on that. Uh, they're working on uh, philosophy or mathematics or whatever. They want to study something and they really do want to just like focus on something at least for a, for a moment. Um, but people would do that. It, it's not like there's this weird idea that people wouldn't do shit if they weren't motivated by having a gun to their heads where you absolutely have to, you know, make money or you're fucked. Um, and, and, and it's also not, I, I certainly do think, <laughs> I, I, I want to be very clear that I also know people who are like communists and Marxists and all of this. And I think they also, it, it's kind of a weird um, funhouse mirror version of objectivism. Like you have people who have these very simplified ideas of how uh, how markets work, how economics work, how people work. And I think both of those sound pretty good superficially if you don't think too much about it and you're kind of aligned already with them and it's, you know, like there's a confirmation bias aspect. But they also, um, yeah, they're not complete in any way and they're both fundamentally broken because they don't really understand basic, basic aspects of human nature. And they both fall apart very quickly uh, when exposed to reality. Um, and, and you could say like, okay, well, communism's never actually been tried, Scott. And yeah, kind of. But if you look at the history, like I, I do think the people who were revolutionaries at one point had good intentions and they wanted to, Im they wanted to do everything they could to implement these ideas that they thought were great. And then at a certain point, like, things start falling apart and you're like, oh shit. And it kind of, um, kind of, whether you want it or not, it ends up being becoming a totalitarian regime because A, you can't have people talking honestly about th the fact that things aren't working in our perfect system. And B, if you don't put a gun to people's heads, certain things, especially, you know, at, at times where you do need labor, and you do need people to do stuff that they don't necessarily want to do, uh, or it's not like their their lifelong passion. You know, things will not get done, and then you'll be you know you'll be in a pretty bad situation. There were there were certainly a lot of other problems, of course, like uh, crop failures. Where yeah, you, know, you try to do central planning and you don't understand things, and then you end up causing massive famines. It, it, there are there are lots of lots of layers to that, but rolling past that. Uh, I'm not presenting an idealized, like, oh, the, the world could just be, you know, rainbows and unicorns and all of this. I'm not saying even that you necessarily have to eliminate some kind of incentive for people to do things that are not necessarily the most fun. Um, you know, and certainly in the moment, there are things that are absolutely essential, often things that are not compensated well, but there are, you know, like producing food. Uh, plumbers, people doing water treatment or giving us electricity. Uh, these are things that are essentially necessary for our lives to continue as they do, uh, collecting garbage. So you do need something there, at least until we have the level of automation where you could kind of not have that. Although I don't know, I'm not saying that it can't be done in terms of engineering, but I think it's not something that is very likely to be done and certainly anytime soon. Um, yeah, but rolling past that, I think also, I mean, just to dabble, just go back to the Tesla bot a little bit. People are very good using our sort of form factor and kind of figuring out how to do various things. And, and we are, like our hands are very dexterous. We have the ability to make bowls or, you know, pinch things or grab things or point to things, lift and all, all of these things we can do. 
if you don't have that level of intelligence and you don't have a way to go from like, this is the situation, this is my goal, how do I get from here to there? Uh, if you don't have that, uh, it doesn't matter what your body looks like, uh, you're kind of going to struggle unless you, this is one of the reasons why you see so many special purpose robots because to solve a certain problem is not that hard. Um, it takes engineering time and effort, but if you're going to solve one problem, um, you can pretty much do it. And even if that problem is pretty open-ended, you can figure it out even with like 1950s level automation. It's not, you know, not that hard to make an automated train using 1950s technology. Um, although it is harder than you might think because there are a ton of, you know, corner cases that come up. That's a very controlled environment and, you know, but, but you can kind of do it. When you start getting to actually like, oh, I'm going to make a machine, like picking strawberries is a giant labor intensive pain in the ass and it sucks. And I'm going to make a machine to do it. Um, partly good luck. And I'm not saying it can't be done, but it, it's a ridiculously hard engineering problem. Uh, cleaning a toilet, relatively hard. Doing the dishes. Making a machine that can do the dishes and clean the toilet and not cross-contaminate between, uh, you know, I mean, granted, literally everything is covered in literal shit, but still, you probably don't want to facilitate that or expand it. Uh, it. It's pretty challenging. And so I'm not saying, like, that's magically going to get fixed. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, you could imagine, like, if you were compensating people better, uh, maybe picking strawberries as much as it sucks... It sucks less if you're getting paid 20 or 30 bucks an hour and you can actually have a nice life doing it. And you have a lot of things where, you know, okay, maybe you, you don't have to toil in the fields for like 60 hours a week. Maybe you can do it 20 hours and you just kind of, you know, do that. You do some other stuff on the side. Um, it's much, much less, like it doesn't have to be this fucked up and this complicated. You don't have to sit there and I keep coming back to this word toil, but you don't need to toil, um, especially not endlessly and especially not without um, any kind of breaks, without any kind of humanity to what you're doing in life. Uh, you don't need to sap the last little drop of juice out of everybody and make them work themselves to the point where they have no time to explore other interests. Um, you know. I don't think that that's a fantasy world. I think that's something that could totally exist. And in fact, I know it can. Yeah. And it, the fact that it doesn't is entirely on us. And I would like to see us get there. It seems like a thing that you maybe, you know, kind of look at the situation and go like, oh, we could actually do that. Uh, why not? You know, it, it, it's, it's maddening to me, frankly, that things are the way they are and they could be so much better, but we don't change them. We don't fix them. And, and incidentally, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I get so irritated with, um, you know, I, I don't want to like pick the scab of the Bernie bro thing, but it's one of the reasons why I get so bothered by that whole thing, because I'm not saying what Bernie was pushing for was like a panacea, um, but it would be a marked improvement. And, you know, like setting up this whole idea that, I, I don't know, I, I fucking find it disgusting, frankly. Like you have, you, you have the situation where you've come up with this term, Bernie bro. Um, and, and it's used to mean things like people who are like wildly misogynistic and threatening like death and rape and terrible things. And then, you know, you have that kind of abstract idea, which doesn't reflect reality really. And then people say things like, okay, well, they were a little bit impolite at the convention and a little bit pissed off and stomping and loud. Um, you know, which, and, and they at the convention were not like, all Bernie supporters. It was just a vocal little group that was there, but still like bleeding these two things together, like uh, they're not the fucking same thing. And it's one of the things like there's no room for contrast or subtlety or, you know, 
if, if by Bernie bro you meant like the person that's just going to be a little bit impertinent and you know say like hey this could be better uh, hey this is not fair that uh, we basically had the um, hey this is not fair that Obama made some calls and fucked things up before Super Tuesday and got people to drop out and uh, pull for Biden to make him win um, not cool it's not cool and to say that you know, like me being upset about that is the same as somebody doing this other horrible shit, it's a little offensive. You know, it bothers me more than a little bit. It's one of the reasons why I can't, you know, I just can't accept that and I can't get past it. I'm not going to, to be cool with that. Uh, the Obama boy thing didn't stick, but Hillary tried the same fucking thing there. Uh, you know, and the fact that, it, I don't know, it's just annoying. It's like the the history of jaywalking, um, which, incidentally, with YouTube, I um, I watch several things by Simon Whistler, English bald guy, uh, and one of the things he had recently was about the history of jaywalking and the term and the concept and the legal idea of it, and basically it started out as you know like cars were kind of being beaten down because they kept killing pedestrians and the auto industry sort of started going like, eh, let's change the fucking script here. Came up with the term jaywalking, did a bunch of PR to make um, jaywalkers, you know, like people crossing the street, uh, basically they convert the street to the domain of the cars. And then, you know, got a lot of laws passed and basically made, you know, the streets giant caverns that we can't go into, you know, like fucking pits and we're stuck. We're just confined to the sidewalk. Um, you know, they did this stuff ends up not actually helping anything like the, the death rates for pedestrians in the UK where there's no jaywalking law and where I actually like the very, the first day that I was in London, I saw a Bobby jaywalk and I came from, Tempe, where if you jaywalk across Mill Avenue, um, I've seen people get like $200 tickets for that. It's crazy, the contrast. And it was just like, oh, this is like how things should fucking be. You know, and I'm not saying you should just jaywalk blindly, but you know, look for traffic. And if there's no car coming, yeah, and you're pragmatically going to cross. Now I'm also, to be fair, um, rural road, is like uh, three lanes of traffic both ways plus a middle lane. People are going like 50, 55 miles an hour. It is very far to get to a stoplight, which is another thing about like our cities are built for cars and not people. But, you know, I've seen people like a woman with a baby carriage and some little kids cross that um, and not really, not really like wait until the most opportune time necessarily. I'm not suggesting you do that kind of shit. You know, but also, like, I do understand pragmatically, if you're there and you're like, well, shit, I have to walk five minutes that way and five minutes back to, to get to a light versus I could just cross now. Um, yeah, I, I think really the, the problem there is sort of the way things are set up. But anyway, getting back to the point there, uh, jaywalking, brilliant marketing term and, you know, took really well, similar to the Bernie bro thing. Um, I can't, you know, I, I hate the term. I, I cannot claim that it did not work very effectively. And I have people who I know generally align with me politically and some of whom even listen to or watch this and they're kind of taken in by it and it annoys the shit out of me because it's like, okay, I mean, going back to this convention thing, I'm not saying that's necessarily the nicest, most courteous thing to do. Um, and, and certainly there are people who are like Bernie or bust, but to blame them for losses in 2016 and 2020, uh, or 2020, I guess one, but, uh, was much closer than it could have been. I don't think it's at all fair. And especially like in 2016, and I, this is going to be the last thing I say, I fucking campaigned for Hillary. Now I'm not a huge fan of hers. I, I do think. Like, I have some empathy for her, I understand, like, how you get to where she is. But 
not my favorite person. I definitely think like, you know, you get beaten down, you have a couple ways you can go. One is to just sort of get really cynical and sort of say, fuck it, and get a little bit um, of avarice among, you know, your, your motivations. And then another is to sort of say, well, shit, this sucks, I'm gonna fix it. Uh, I think she went more toward the former than the latter. But nonetheless, I could see how bad Donald Trump was. I could see that he could win. And I was, you know, fucking disappointed and beaten down that Bernie lost. And I was also, like, really punched in the nuts over this fucking Bernie bro shit. And still, I was fucking volunteering every week, um, knocking on fucking doors for Hillary, telling everybody that I knew on Facebook, like, this motherfucker could win vote for Hillary even if you don't like her. Uh, you know, I was doing this shit, and then you get punched in the fucking gut with this Bernie bro shit, and it just, like, makes me want to scream. I, it, you know, it's like... And it's not like I was some weird anomalous guy. Like, I... Now, granted, it was Tempe. Not necessarily representative of every Democratic district or whatever. But where I was, the guy who was running the volunteers was a Bernie supporter. More than half of the people that I was out knocking doors with were Bernie supporters. It was kind of funny, actually, because the Hillary supporters were not fucking showing up. I mean, you know, I'm not saying there were none, but by and large, they weren't out there, like, knocking doors for her. They weren't out there calling people for her. And it, it ticks me the fuck off that you're going to just malign me and people like me with this completely unfair characterization of... Uh, because some people were impertinent at the the convention after frankly and, and i felt this as well like it was a very unfair uh primary like the whole process and the whole way it was conducted was not cool the like automatically instantly counting all of the superdelegate votes way before anything was decided and making it look like bernie was completely lost way before he actually was not cool telling everybody that Bernie should drop out way before he was actually out of the running, way before Hillary dropped out in 2008, um, not fucking cool. So I'm a little bit bitter about it, is all I'm saying. Anyway, with that, I have a meeting in a couple minutes. I got to wrap up. Um, thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, this is not sponsored. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to keep it that way, actually. And I would love to see more people here not sponsor shit. I'd love to see like cool things that are just essentially free or, you know, maybe you have some way to make money, but um, less emphasis on the money making and more emphasis on ways of life that actually work better that don't require people to, to do that shit. Um, I know we're not there yet, uh, but I'd love to get there. With that, thank you again, and uh, it's IGN.